my name is Jane Marie Franks, and we are in my backyard in Clifton, Tennessee. And this is just my quiet, small town, quiet home. <laughs> I love Operation Christmas Child. I know that some kid is gonna get a blessing out of it and I always think what if I was in that position of receiving that box? Just thinking about how much a box could just change a kid's life, it's just so incredible. We originally started packing shoe boxes with my church and my family has continued since. We have done shoe boxes since she was small, but we didn't do as many as we do now. That was always exciting to her to go buy things to fill a shoe box. Each year when it comes around, we go to stores like Hobby Lobby and pick out each item. I can't wait to get the paper, the pencil. Crayons, toothbrushes. I also like the cuddly toys. Hats, gloves. My favorite item is a teddy bear. <laughs> We couldn't have children. So Carolyn stayed after me for years and years on end to but let's adopt, let's adopt. And I said, if you want to adopt, let's have it. Well, when I got home, we were signed up to, to start the, the process. And so here we are, this, what, 15 and a half years later, we've, we've got Jane Marie. I was born in Guatemala I was adopted and was six months old when I was brought to Clifton, Tennessee. God wanted me to be here, and so he allowed me to come into their lives. It was in 2019 that I got to go back and visit my home country and to learn more about the history, the culture, the people. And I remember this one boy asking for money to be able to go to school. You know, in the morning on Monday, I dread going to school. That's my nightmare. But to him, that was his dream. And that was something that really struck me to want to start packing shoe boxes even more for the kids. That touched her so much that uh, she has a desire to help others. Operation Christmas Child opens up a way for a child to learn about the gospel. Just something so small could just mean the world to somebody else. Last year, I had the opportunity to pack with just my family, 500 alone, and this year for my 16th birthday, we had the opportunity to invite a bunch of people to pack another 500 boxes. It was so much fun. We have learned that I think over 160 million shoe boxes have been delivered all around the world into remote locations because I always go and look, where did our shoe boxes go? To me, it means the last three verses in Matthew. Go forth, preach, teach, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And this is the way for us to go through Operation Christmas Child. And this entire journey has just been so amazing. I only just hope to encourage others to share the good news. It might be 500 boxes, it might be one, it might be two. I just hope to share with you all the joy of giving to others, allowing God to use you. The best way to describe it is just awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So great a mercy, my heart. 
line with the, the video, we want to say thanks to our veterans. If you are a veteran, can you stand up if you have served in the military? Just want to say thank you for your your service. We know Veterans Day is on Thursday, and just want to take this chance to to say Happy Veterans Day now and say thanks to y'all for your service. And we we appreciate appreciate you all and what you've done for our country. So with that, I want to give you guys a welcome here today. Say thank you so much for coming, whether you're here in person or you're online. We're so glad to 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 have you here this morning. So I want to go through a few announcements. There's a lot in your bulletin, so if you have a chance to pick one of those up today and read it, cut some things out, post them on your fridge so you can remember. I don't know if people still do that, but that's where I put a lot of my important notes, on the fridge or the kitchen table, one of those places. But we have a lot going on next Sunday. So next Sunday is Faith Promise Sunday, and we have special guest speakers, Nate Owens and his wife Hope and their kids, Forrest and Peter. I want to say during 2020 when we were online, or no, they joined us online and have preached here before, but they'll be coming back, and this time they're in person, so we don't have to worry about lag times and all that good stuff. So they will be here in person next week sharing the word of the Lord with us, sharing about where they've been on missions and where they're going on missions, and the whole focus of the service next week is on world missions and how we can support that. As a church, we'll be passing out pledge cards to support Faith Promise and the Church Nazarene missionary work. And also, along with Faith Promise, will be Alabaster Sunday. So the Alabaster offering provides funds for property and buildings for churches around the world. So if you've seen those little boxes out in the foyer and you need one to put some funds in, you can go grab one today. And so next week, we'll be collecting those. So just encourage you guys to, to come out for Faith Promise and listen to ways we can get involved and help missionaries throughout the world, also how we can give funds to, to help build churches and such. And then also next week after church, you have another opportunity to support missions and outreach. So after the church service, we're going to be packing Christmas boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Our goal is to pack 200 boxes as a church. So after service next week, we'll head into the gym There'll be pizza for those that stay, or some type of food. I said pizza, so hopefully that was the plan. But there'll be food in there. We'll make sure you're, you're fed. and will be packing boxes for boys and girls throughout the world. I encourage you guys to participate in those. If you, we are going to be buying some things this week to fill the boxes with. So if you were wanting to make a donation of goods, and you're like, well, I haven't got anything yet, if you would be willing to donate money, then we can use that money to buy the items we still need, because we'll fill at least, we're buying stuff for at least 200 boxes, and then whatever we fill above and beyond that, but if you would like to designate any funds to that, please, you know, designate, you know, Operation Christmas Child, or talk with um, Amy Ayers or Julie Gatrell, and we'll make sure those funds get, get used for purchasing those things to fill boxes with. And one more thing we're up to as we're getting into the holidays, and just really trying to be mission-focused and people-oriented, we have a local opportunity to help people in our own community that need winter gear. So we are partnering with Loved Again Charities and Casa of Green County to do a winter gear drive for children and teenagers in our own county. And so we are collecting boots, coats, blankets, gloves, hats, scarves. I forgot to put socks in here, socks as well, especially winter socks. And we're collecting until November 28th. So anything, if you can donate any of those items, gently used or new, and drop them in the foyer. Now, I had talked to the, the person in charge of CASA who's in charge of this event, and he said that, I mean, obviously any items you want to donate, they'll take, but they are in desperate need of winter socks, boots, and coats for all the ages. They said they're doing really good on gloves and hats, but they need a lot of socks, boots, and coats. So if you can help with any of that, that would be great. We will be collecting until November 28th. So definitely trying to be the hands and feet of the Lord with um, global missions and local missions and just encourage you guys to participate in one or all the causes coming up to, to help be a difference. So again, take a look at your bulletin. 
Um, also, I got to try to do what Pastor always does. If you are a visitor today, you get one of these handy dandy mugs. I believe they are in the foyer. And so that's a, just a gift to say thank you. So if you're here, take advantage of a chance to get a mug, go out in the foyer, and we'll, we'll get you a mug, and you can drink some coffee or water or whatever people, whatever you drink. So anywho, again, just want to thank you for being here. And as I mentioned Faith Promise earlier, I have a, a video to show to explain a little bit more about Faith Promise and what we'll be doing next week. Everywhere we look in Nazarene Missions, we are seeing a movement of the Holy Spirit to bring salvation and restoration through the people of God. We believe that through faith, God will continue to do amazing things. See, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith is a choice, and His promise is clear. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So how do we step out in faith? How do we connect with God's promise? How do we join His movement? Every Church of the Nazarene is encouraged to share a percentage of their income to Nazarene missions. These funds are essential to spread the gospel and to support our missionaries. Many churches step out in faith beyond this encouraged percentage through Faith Promise. This one weekend each year emphasizes the missional work of the local congregation and the global church. They are challenged to give generously to share Christ's transformational love with the world. But this isn't a calculated pledge. It's a promise made by faith that God will provide. A promise that He will do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. Faith promise is about stepping out in faith. It's about the giving of our resources so that the good news can be shared. God will answer our prayers of hope and fulfill His promise. God is moving through His people around the world and through Faith Promise. Nazarene Missions invites you to join the movement. Hey. 
good you may be seated it is good to be in the house of the Lord I want to thank you for blessing my heart when I walked through those doors this morning and I saw we've got a collection of coats and gloves and we've got stuff going on with Operation Christmas Child and we've got alabaster boxes out and we've got the food cupboard open and it's filling up it is good to be part of a body of Christ that is seeking local engagement and international impact. We serve a good God, and thank you for being my church family. Um, I'm here because Pastor Gary is a little bit under the weather. We're going to be, uh, I'm doing things a little bit differently. It's kind of a narrative, first-person perspective sermon from Peter's perspective, so don't be surprised when that comes. But first, let's stand for the reading of the word. Our readings from the Gospel of Luke, the eighth chapter. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading for him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding around and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him, except Peter, John, and James, and the parents' father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once... She stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I'm Peter. I have been with him from the very beginning of his ministry, you know. I know him really well. He came to me and he called me from a fishing boat. There was power in him, and when he told me to throw those nets in one more time to catch a fish, I felt like I didn't have a choice except to obey him. And when those nets came up full of fish, and I realized how sinful I was, you know, that's how he is. He doesn't go around telling you how miserable and rotten you are. He doesn't point out your sin. He's not mean. He just is and he is so pure and so holy that next to him you just can't help but feeling sinful so I left everything that day me my brother Andrew our friends James and John we could see right away that he was different that he was somebody special and from that very day in my heart I really 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 wanted him 
to be the one. I really, really, really wanted him to be the Messiah that we had been waiting for. But it didn't take a whole long time following him around Galilee to realize that, well, as they say, well, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. That was Jesus, if you know what I mean. Who in their right mind calls a tax collector to a messianic movement? I mean, there were plenty of good Jews trying to be good Jews. Why didn't he just call more people like me? And instead, he calls this tax collector, Levi Matthew. Now, it did turn out that Levi Matthew wasn't quite as bad as I thought he was going to be. I kind of expected a rich snob. Uh, so when Jesus picked him, I was highly skeptical. But he turns out to be a good guy, and he has some good math skills. That's handy. So now I'm thinking, maybe Jesus was more strategic than I thought. Maybe he thought, tax collectors, no rich people. It's never a bad thing to have rich friends. You see, we're stuck here in Galilee, and I really know we need to get to Jerusalem. Because as Jews, that is where the action is. That's where things happen. I hope that we get to go there for one of the festivals. And then Jesus can get the audience that he really deserves and that he really needs. So we could use some rich friends. Maybe it was a good idea, picking Matthew. I have this idea that Jesus just needs a little bit of guidance. And then he'd really be able to make an impact on the world. You know, he's doing great things here in Galilee. When you see people healed of leprosy and, oh my goodness, the day that he took that widow's son and raised him from the dead, oh, you talk about excitement. He needs a wider audience. We need some patrons, some wealthy sponsors, if we're going to make it to Jerusalem. And I really like that centurion that Jesus healed. You know, I'm a Jew. I don't really know a whole lot of Romans. But this guy was important and smart enough to listen to Jesus. But then Jesus doesn't even let us go to his house. He just says something like, oh, well, you've got, a lot of, you've got a lot of faith, so the healing's already happened. I thought, Jesus, why not go? Never hurts to meet this guy's friends. And as a good Jew, I've never been inside a rich person's house, and I was kind of curious. But again, Jesus just doesn't get how you play these games. He needs some guidance. He doesn't get politics in our world. I mean, I might just be a fisherman from Galilee, but I listen. I put in at ports all over the Sea of Galilee. And at the end of the day, around the campfire, people talk, they gossip, and I listen. People are tired, tired, tired of the Romans, tired of their taxes, tired of their bossiness, tired of being ground down. People are looking for a Messiah. And the thing about Jesus is he might actually be the Messiah. He has such presence. And he knows scripture as though he wrote it himself. Even the Pharisees are a little nervous. So I know that if we just play our cards right, we can change the world with this guy in charge. All we have to do is get to Jerusalem. We can't do anything wandering around Galilee. Which brings us to today. We had spent a few days over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee uh, where Jesus drove some demons into a herd of pigs. Let me tell you, that was a sight to see a whole bunch of pigs running over a cliff into the sea and drowning. Now, I personally, as a good Jew, I keep the kosher laws, I don't eat pork, but I think those Gentiles ate really well yesterday. So we came back over here where we belong, the Jewish side of the lake. Because this Messiah thing, it's Jewish. It's promised in the scriptures. This is how God is going to fix us and take care of us. And we need these things to happen in Jerusalem. We need to get there. So we come back, and one of the first people we see is Jairus. He's a leader in this synagogue. He has some power. He knows some people. And he really needs Jesus his daughter is sick. It would have been better if his son was sick rather than his daughter. But girls count too, so, you know, Jairus likes them, so likes her. So we went over, and we start going to his house. And I'm thinking, important people have important friends. 
And if Jesus can heal this girl, this might be our opportunity. So we're going, and I'm kind of in a rush, like, okay, Lord, let's get here, let's get there. And he stops cold. And he says, who touched me? I'm thinking, Lord. And I told him, there's all these people here. It could have been anybody. And he won't let us keep going until he finds out who touched him. And so we ask, and finally this woman comes forward. It was me. And she gives her whole back story. I couldn't care less about this woman. I'm in a rush to get to Jairus' house. I'm in a rush to get there. I think we can use that opportunity. But Jesus, he stops. And she has thrown herself at his feet. And he takes her and lifts her up and says, your faith has healed you. And the way that he looks at her, the love in his eyes, the compassion in his face, looking as though she's the only person there. And for just a second, I thought, maybe that's what it's about for him. Not getting to Jerusalem, but really seeing everybody and recognizing them as made in the image of God. Even this dirty woman who's unclean, who can't go to the synagogue, who is broke. And I think for a second, maybe I got it all wrong. But before I can really even process that, somebody else comes and says to Jairus, your daughter's dead, leave the teacher alone. And at first I think, missed opportunity. But then I remember the widow's son. And I think, he can do this again. So we go on to the house. And when we get to Jairus' house, there's a lot of people around, and they're all carrying on. His wife came out, and oh, the look on her face. Her daughter was dead. She was devastated. I was expecting something pretty dramatic from Jesus at this point. I mean, this was a good audience for a big miracle. And instead, he only takes five people into her room where her corpse is with him. Me, James, John, her mom and dad. And he says, little girl, get up. And just like that, this pale, pale face slowly infuses with color. And her little chest starts to rise and fall. And her little eyelids start to flutter. And the first one that says anything, of course, is her mom, because she knows that child was dead, and now she knows that child is alive. And I think, what could be more amazing than God using his power on this little girl? People surely will listen now. Surely they'll realize that this is a man that we can get behind. And what does Jesus say? Don't tell anybody keep silent about it and I think Lord this isn't how we need to do this we need to let people know what you're doing because this Jesus he is great but he really needs some guidance so that we can get to Jerusalem so that we can get where the action is I used a different format to get you thinking about Scripture because there was a time when Jesus didn't know the risen Christ. He was just another traveler on the dusty roads of Galilee following Jesus, hoping for a Messiah, but not yet filled with the Holy Spirit and not yet the powerful preacher whose very shadow had the power to heal. It's so easy for us having all of scripture to shake our heads at how slow the disciples were to recognize Jesus in his power as he walked with them. But the challenge then is right now in the middle of your story, what are you missing? 
about Jesus? What is Jesus trying to show you and show us as a congregation that we are missing? Who in our lives do you, who in my life do I fail to recognize as being made in the image of God, of, as being worthy of grace and forgiveness? Where are you not trusting the way that God and Jesus are leading your life? You see, we all struggle like Peter did to see how Jesus is doing things in our lives. Even Peter, as he was physically there with Jesus, didn't get it. And we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, still manage to miss the lessons sometimes. You know, the values of the kingdom, recognizing that God is working in history, recognizing that everybody is made in the image of God, recognizing that Jesus wants me and you to build the kingdom. These are easy things to understand in church, but we often find they're a whole lot harder when we're out there in the world. So today, as we take communion, I ask that you would pray for God to give you a vision. Ask him to show you how he is walking alongside you in your journey of life. Ask him to point out the people that you most need to reach out to. Ask him how he wants you and how he wants us to continue to build the kingdom, knowing that we only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the first Sunday of the month, we will be doing communion. Um, in the Church of the Nazarene, you do not have to be a member to partake in communion, we have what we call open communion, where anyone is welcome to come and partake in the, ele in the elements. Although I have a theological education and am a teacher, um, having God having never placed a full-time call to ministry on my life, I am not ordained in the Church of the Nazarene, so I cannot uh, preside over communion. My husband will be doing that. He's handy to have for that. Um, but before we do communion, Pastor Gary wanted us to recite the Apostles' Creed together. It'll be up on the screen. Let's say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That is a creed that has been spoken by believers across the world in various languages since the fourth century. It is a distillation of what it means to be a believer. I thank God for the opportunity to share in that history with us. Judy? Church of Nazareth, as Melody said, that our communion is an open table. You don't have to be a member of this congregation or to be a member of the Church of Nazareth. But what I would ask you to do is they pass uh, the cups to you. Just do a little bit of introspection. Give yourself to God. Let's look at ourselves within. 
we pray so that when we receive these elements, they will be of great use in our lives. blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you and me to preserve us blameless unto the everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance of me as Christ died for us. Let us partake of the cup. We shall pray one of our, the classic prayers by Thomas Aquinas. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for having pleased through no merit of mine, but your great mercy alone, to feed me, a sinner, and your unworthy servant, with the precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this Holy Communion may not be my judgment and condemnation, but for my pardon and salvation. Let the Holy Communion be to me an armor of faith and a shield of goodwill, a cleansing of all vices, 
and a rooting out of all evil desires. May it increase love, patience, humility, and obedience, and all virtues. May it be a firm defense against the evil designs of all my visible and invisible enemies. A perfect quieting of all the desires of soul and body. May this holy communion bring about a perfect union with you, the one true God, and at last enable me to reach eternal bliss. I pray that you bring me, a sinner, to the indescribable feast where you, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, are to your saints true light, full blessedness, everlasting joy, and perfect happiness. Through the name of our Lord and Jesus Christ. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free. Okay. 